This is Bounty, the Atari 8-bit podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz, and this is an interview episode of Antic, the Atari 8-bit podcast. In this episode, two interviews for the price of one, two people who helped create High res Magazine, the computer magazine that only published four issues. First, we'll hear from Tony Nicholson, the publisher of High res Magazine, then John Babinchak, the editor of that magazine. High res was a short-lived magazine dedicated to Atari and Commodore 8-bit computers. It was published from late 1983 to early 1984. Although they didn't publish months on the cover, I believe the first issue would have had a cover date of November 1983. Subsequent issues would have been January 1984, March 1984, and the final issue of May 1984. Hi-Rez came to the Atari magazine party late in the game, fighting against magazines with established advertiser and subscription bases. Analog Computing magazine started in January 1981, almost a full three years before High res and Antic Magazine's first issue was April 1982. Creative Computing was starting its 10th year around that time. You can read all four issues of High res magazine at atarimagazines.com and archive.org. First up, my interview with Tony Nicholson, the publisher, which occurred on September 24, 2015 interested in its its birth and death so let's start at the beginning why have you did you publish magazines before high res were you just interested in atari how, how did how did they get started it was started based on the atari and commodore systems and i made a bad bet ibm came out shortly after and i didn't cover i uh, uh obviously ibm And on that basis, I took it on a chin because, unfortunately, the Atari and uh, Commodore software manufacturers and, frankly, the manufacturers of the equipment, both Atari and Commodore, uh, although they took out some nice ads, they never, a lot of them didn't pay for them. Hmm. And uh, we found ourselves publishing 150,000 magazines a, a month. Uh, based on our Dell contract uh, for distribution. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were selling, I think the first issue did sell about 85,000, if I'm not mistaken, which is not a bad number at all. It's just that uh, the second and third editions started going down in volume. And the art director uh, that mm-hmm. I had hired for the fourth edition messed me up badly. It was a Christmas issue. And he put on an ugly face instead of a Christmas display that we we had already done photographic uh, material for, and I think it it, uh, it was a software writer that we put his picture on, and he wasn't very handsome at the time. <laughs> David Green, and, yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, it went down the tubes. Was well, not very popular. So that's that's what happened. And after the fourth issue, I realized, my God. Uh, the printing costs, the money's not coming in from the uh, the, the advertisers. Uh, subscriptions were not uh, coming in as fluidly, nor and uh, we had to close down. So had you had you hired a whole staff for this? I mean, how many people were? Oh yeah, we had a staff of sixteen people working on the magazine. So was this purely, from the beginning, was this a pure business decision for you, or were you, did you have an Atari computer that you were using and, and you wanted to be in that business? No, it, it was strictly to be in the computer business at that time. Mm-hmm. And I was in the right place, but at the wrong venue, mm-hmm. wrong pew. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just didn't calculate the lack of popularity that would occur within months of the Commodore and Atari systems. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything started to gel IBM and then Apple came out, I believe not too distant future or or later after that. And I just was covering the wrong equipment. Did you think after the four issues come out, did you think about 
uh, re- starting a different magazine that was covering IBM or Apple or something else? Well, there, at the time, there were several that already had started. Mm-hmm. And I saw myself being in the mix of all of those. And uh, I decided not for me right. at that time. I still own the title High Res, which is a good name. And uh, I don't know. I, I thought over the years I would do something with it, but I, I haven't. If anybody's got a good idea what they'd like to do, I'd be very happy to hear from them. <laughs> so you said that people, that advertisers weren't paying for their ads. I'd like to talk a little more about that. Um, I've heard stories here and there that Atari wouldn't always pay for their ads in later years, but it sounds like this was more of a rampant thing. Yeah, it, um, it was mostly the software manufacturers, but also the hardware. But I'm not casting aspersions. Atari... I, you know, make some popular games, really came out with the first of all the games. And uh, I thought it would exceed sales uh, of Commodore, but it, uh, Commodore came up kind of quickly, and then all of a sudden, everything fell apart. Yeah. It definitely, as a reader, it looks it looked like High Red was trying to find its place. It started off saying, uh, the first issue was like, we're going to do Atari and the Atari VCS home game unit. And then... The second issue sort of mentions Commodore's coming, and, and third issue is like we're Commodore magazine now too. And then, and yeah, so it, and then, and then, and then I think in the final issue it said uh, you were going to do less games and more, more applications, more you know useful tools. And then, right. Then the, there's no fifth issue. <laughs> so. Well, I'll tell you, I'm a true entrepreneur, and I latch on, and I do make obviously investments in things that may or may not work. And my theory has always been, as long as you make more than you lose, you're okay. And with the fact that it was losing substantially after the second issue and the monies weren't fluid and coming in, I closed it down, cut my losses. Sure, sure. Now, I mean, when I was Googling around to to find out how to contact you, I mean, it looks like um, you've had more wins than losses. It looks like you're a, you're a real estate mogul and a ph- philanthropist and uh, you've, you've done well for yourself between high res and now. I'll tell you, it's been a very interesting 77 years for me. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> uh, I've had a lot of heartache and I've had a lot of good times. And uh, the good times are great. The heartache is horrible. Yeah. And uh, you you just try to minimize your risks as as best you can, and certainly your losses. And that's what happened with uh, high res. So tell me, dredge up a story about uh, about high res that we haven't talked about yet. Someone someone you you worked with, or uh, setting up the office, or well, a lot of them uh, went on to uh, become involved with the Orlando Sentinel newspaper in town. Mm Uh, in other publications, and uh, others went in different directions. Um, between you and I, for me to remember the names at this stage of uh, time, it, it would be very difficult. No, no, I'm not asking for names uh, at all. I just, you know, uh, I was just wondering if you had a you know, story about something interesting that happened in creating the magazine. No, no I, I think it helped the careers of several people that were engaged in the magazine as they pursued other forms of publication. And as you may have not, if you haven't, you'll find that at the University of Central Florida, the School of Communications named the Nicholson School of Communication. And I did that because I really believed in all forms of publication and uh, public relations and uh, radio and television and certainly magazines and newspapers. Um, right now the school is considered one of the finest in the South and has a tremendous, uh, uh, exposure worldwide with transfer people transfer here. The study of the school from Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Austria. And we of course have comparably sending our students to those far reaches as well. What haven't I asked you about high res that I should have? 
I don't think you've done a, you've done a pretty, it's a pretty short history yeah. and therefore it's uh, pretty uh, much complete with what you've asked. I, I think that the publication, uh, there were mistakes made. I, I printed too many issues based on what Dell wanted me to, and I shouldn't have uh, relied on their guesstimate as to what I would print. And I would be a lot better off, and it would have saved enough money to carry on for at least another couple of issues. But we were forced into the 150000 by their commitment and um, per month, and it just was too much. That was a, like a printing commitment? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, so were most and of the your... the printing costs are extraordinarily high. The paper we used and everything about it was, was expensive. Mm-hmm. So I assume that most of your sales were... Because the magazine was so young, the sales were newsstand as opposed to subscription. That's true. Uh, the amount of subscribers, I can't remember, but it was nominal in comparison to the newsstand. Do you remember what remember what happened to the subscriptions of subscribers? Did they get some other magazine? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we either reimbursed them or compensated them with other issues or something of that nature. Okay. Uh, all right, last question. Um, if you could send a message to the Atari computer users that still exist, and you can right now, what would you tell them? I would tell them that the machines, by this time, if they're still working, it's a miracle. And if the software, I haven't seen software made for Atari in ages, have you? Uh, there's a few hobbyist users who are still making it, but it more, you know, not a hobby, as a hobby, not a business. Right. I mean, it's so far behind PlayStation and uh, uh, Xbox uh, and, the, the you know, the two that are out now. The graphics are nothing that can compare with what's out there. And uh, I, I, I'm i surprised that there's still people that are using it. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for the interview. Bye-bye. Next up, my interview with John Babinchak, the editor. This interview occurred on September 29th, 2015. Tell me uh, how how you got how you got started with that gig. Well, the, the magazine had already been started, and um, they were looking for an editor to to essentially run the editorial operation of it. And that's where I was brought in. They reached out to me, and and it looked like something new and interesting. And that was during uh, kind of the height of the computer gaming magazine craze, where I think at one point, uh, in a short period I was with the magazine, there were more than 300 such magazines out there. Um, and so it's, it's, it looked like something that was on the edge of something big and fun. And so that's how I got involved. Nice. How, why did they reach out to you? Did you have uh, what were you doing before? Did you have experience with computers and video games? Or my my background was in 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 journalism. I was a, a news editor at a newspaper at the time, so they were looking for somebody with journalism background mm-hmm. to come in and basically give it more of a newsy edge than what it was. Um, at that point, it had been mostly features of new games and systems and and some reviews of games, but um, for the most part, it didn't really have any any new developments in the gaming world yet. So what did you do to make it more newsy? We just tried to be uh, closer in touch with uh, uh, essentially the the those who were involved with development and, and, and a lot of the software writers. Uh, and just try to figure out where things were heading, what was really new and innovative. The, the industry was moving very quickly. It was still in such an early stage where we had pages of code for people to basically put next to their computer and type in so that they could have their own basic game on their, on their MS-DOS system. But um, it was, so that, that's how early that this was. It was still very much basic computing. Sure. Um, so four issues were published. Did, did you work on two of them? I think, uh, three of them. I, I think it was, I, I didn't do the premier issue mm. the very first, and that was Atari specific at the time. Right. Um, and, and then uh, clearly Atari and Commodore were running head head. Commodore, I think was actually starting to 
uh, takes a, a lot of ground away from Victoria. I don't really remember the details of the competition at that time, but we recognize that they were equal. Um, and so uh, the publishers made a calculated move to add Commodore to the coverage. That was kind of good and bad because uh, there were a lot of Atari fans that wanted to keep it Atari only. And then, of course, Commodore had his own fans. Right. Who didn't want to read about Atari stuff. <laughs> Right, right. Was, I mean, there were there were two two very different systems, and and you know some a lot of similarities, but very different. And and uh, I I may have this wrong, but I seem to recall Commodore was kind of the Apple to Atari's Windows. You know, it was kind of the Commodore was doing a lot of things that Atari hadn't yet done. Um, but it was it was again I don't recall the competition and exactly who was on first and who was who was leading the charge, but Commodore was making a lot of uh, news, making a lot of headlines at the time. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there was a real rivalry between Atari users and Commodore users, and like yeah. trying to put them, put them together in the same magazine was like, you know, uh, <laughs> like Hatfields and McCoys sort of thing, so... You're, you're, you're exactly right. It was uh, <laughs> we were we were competing for very two different uh, opposing audiences, and and we 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 got some feedback on that, um, but it did expand our circulation. We did pick up readers, so there was interest, um, even if it was just curiosity. Um, ultimately, I think the the demise of the magazine had nothing to do with the editorial content that we were providing, but more that we just couldn't compete at the level of some of the bigger ones. And of course the shakeout came very quickly. Um, just as, you know, we've seen shakeouts in other areas of, of digital that um that no way so many different magazines, so many niche magazines could survive. Right. So how many people were on your staff? Did you were they were all your writers in house or did you have freelancers or uh, the, the editing and production, uh, 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 graphics and things like that were all done in-house. We had about a half a dozen people on staff. All of the writing, however, was done by freelancers. Now, when I talked to Tony, he mentioned that uh, something that really upset him was for the what the issue that was coming out around Christmas time. Instead of a Christmas scene on the cover, there's a big old picture of David Crane, who he said was was not the the most handsome gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember him. That uh, I actually came in right after that. Well, mm. I, I guess I probably helped wrap that up. That's mm. right. That would be the second issue, I think. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think I that was already pretty much completed. But you know, I mean. You come out at Christmas time, you've already missed the Christmas buying period. You have to kind of, from a new standpoint, you have to be ahead of Christmas. You you start writing about that and covering that before the shopping season begins, so to speak. So did you use Atari computers before this or, or during this time? Me personally? Me yeah. personally? Yeah, you personally. Yeah, I, yeah I, had, I had played with it. I had an Atari at home. And I uh, just kind of goofed around with it, um, but I was far from an expert on on gaming. Yeah, tell me a story. Tell me about something that 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 was uh, interesting or difficult or or surprising during your your tenure there. Well, probably the most interesting thing that happened is as we were venturing down the Commodore uh, lane, so to speak, uh, we went actually went up, uh, Tony and I went up to visit Com- Commodore at his headquarters and it was all prearranged. We were just going to chat with some of their software developers and just and hardware developers and just kind of get to know a little bit more about how they operated. So that was all prearranged and we got up there and I don't remember the, ind- the individual who met us at the door, but he let us in and he walked us through the, the building. We were getting a little tour of the place and it was very, uh, Google-like in this atmosphere, a very fun-looking place with a lot of young faces. Of course, I was young at the time, too, so that didn't really impress me. <laughs> but um, but it was an exciting-looking place, and it was just a huge, huge operation. And we would probably have been in the building for, let's say, 45 minutes, 
And two security uh, individuals came up to us and said, you have to leave the building, you have to leave the building now. And um, we kind of gave them an odd look and what's going on. And, and basically we were told that, that they just felt we should not be in the building. And we were never given an explanation, but I suspect it had to do something with somebody realized that our magazine also covered Atari. And so all of a sudden you'd let the, uh, <laughs> the competition in the door. And I guess they feared we were going to steal trade secrets or something like that. Um, we never got close enough to any proprietary information to even know about any trade secrets. But um, <laughs> it was kind of very unexpected because we had flown up there just specifically for that. And um, and we never actually met with any individuals. We were still on the uh, nickel tour uh, when we were, um, you know, gently have to leave the building. <laughs> so that, was, that, that gave a taste of just the, the incredible competition uh, between Commodore and anyone else, quite honestly. And, you know, it was, in hindsight, it, it should have been expected um, that, that, you know, but, you know, you live and learn. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Any other stories? Any other memories like that? Uh, the really other one, I guess, and, and, and we had a freelance writer uh, named, um, and I'm going to forget if this was his uh, his pen name or his real name, um, Leo Laporte, who wrote that's his, that's his um, quite a name. bit. Mm-hmm. That's his real name. Okay, thank you for reminding me. But he, he wrote quite a bit for us. But as I recall, he uh, by night was writing for us and probably for others, and by day was a disc jockey. So I would often um, catch him in the middle of his um, segment on radio and would be listening to him introduce some jazz song or whatever the music was. And, uh, <laughs> and then he'd kind of shift gears and, and mindset to uh, gaming. <laughs> and so it was kind of, it was kind of an interesting, you, we were dealing with people, individuals who were, you know, just, they were all young. They were just getting started in this industry. And, and, you know, so they had, they had a day job and they had a night job. Um, we had a software writer or a, a writer who, Wrote, someone who wrote for us who was more local to us, Leo, I think, was out in California or somewhere out west. We had one more in central Florida where we were located who um, um, who wrote for us, and but he also was a software writer for Commodore. And um, and uh, went to his house one day, and this house was absolutely empty except for a pinball machine in the living or dining room. Uh, that was his decoration. <laughs> 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 so, so, so you kind of got a sense of the kind of individuals who were deeply involved in in, in all of that back then. Is that they were, you know, just risk takers and eager to to be out front of that. You know, what was then a very early stages of that industry. Right. So your title was editor in chief. Uh, editor or editor in chief? Yeah, I had to actually go back to the magazine and look. <laughs> How long were you employed by them? I was there only six months. Only six months. So, okay, so it's a pretty short time to go from, wow, I've got this new job at this new magazine, to seeing the writing on the wall that the magazine's going to fail. Well, it wasn't really writing on the wall. Tony was a very upfront uh, person, and he he always kept us abreast of how things were going, and, and so we were always sensitive to, to the finances and um and we all all knew it was a high risk um venture because of the competition out there so we we he kind of kept us in the know so that as we were nearing um the end so to speak he was very kind and basically said you can just stay here and use our offices while you look for another job um and and i was fortunate enough to find something almost immediately i don't think i was even out of work at all um so so it was um tony was a real good guy about you know taking care of his people good and you went to the orlando sentinel at that point i went i went to the orlando sentinel and, and helped in a startup of a new publication there nice what haven't i asked you about high res that i should have it's just hard to look back at that that period where people were still spending hours typing in code themselves just to play uh, what today's younger people or anybody who, who is a gamer now would find just incredibly odd. It's kind of like 
looking back at the days before the internet, you know, it's just hard to even envision what it was like before you had connectivity on a global basis. Gaming was very much like that. The kind of games that were being played were just so incredibly basic and uh, rude. It's basically buying an old tube TV versus buying a high res, you know, high definition TV today. It's just, mm-hmm. it was very different back yeah. then. So it's kind of, it was kind of fun to be part of a, uh, of uh, the evolution of, of, of computer gaming, and, and, and as short-lived as it was. <laughs> so, oh, I, another question I just thought of: we we talked about the feedback we got about the addition of Commodore to the magazine. Did you get any other feedback from readers about other topics that you remember? I mean, I read, I read no, the letters to the editor, but you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, what I remember most is they just want, wanted more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, reviews often got some good uh, reader responses where they either agreed or disagreed, but you expect that we never re- review anything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it just, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't provide enough. I mean, it was always a request for more. Um, you know, we we hated if a typo got in because obviously that screwed up the entire coding. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so we were very careful in the proofing of that. But um, I mean, we had pretty good reader support. I I honestly don't remember the circulation, um, and I'm not holding back. I just really don't know how how far our reach was. It was in the thousands, but I tens of thousands. I don't. Rem- I honestly don't recall. What are you doing today? <laughs> what am I doing today? I am director of strategic communications for an organ, a nonprofit organization called the Institute of Internal Auditors. We are a global organization, that, a professional organization of more than 180,000 internal auditors around the world. And my role is communications and, and, and all that that entails. Nice. And you still do all your work on Atari 800, I'm sure. I, I have my Atari right here on my desk. No, I'm sorry to say I don't own an Atari anymore. <laughs> Although I'm, I may find it on an old system in a box somewhere up in my attic, but I'm not sure. <laughs> nice, nice. So, oh, I guess I have one more question. I keep. Was there? Were you working on a fifth issue when the, everything was canceled? I mean, was was issue five in production, or did you? Yeah, we, yeah, we had one in production. In fact, I was actually interviewing for my job at the Orlando Sentinel, we were operating as if it, we were going to put it out, but it never did get put out. Do you remember anything about it, what was on the cover, or what the you know future was? No, I, I don't. I do recover. I mean, as another side story is, and I don't remember who our distributor was in New York, but we had obviously a, a distributor that got us into the, the bookstores and, and such. Mm-hmm. And it, it was always interesting conversation with them over the covers, um, the cover images. Um, they they questioned some. They didn't question the one you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the gentleman who, <laughs> by today's standard, would the programmer, you know, but, um, um, you know, they, obviously they were in part of the distribution, so they wanted magazines to look good. So I'm not sure they always understood the market that we were targeting. Uh, uh, they were more conservative than we probably were. And so we had, um, I think the issue that didn't come out, although I'd have to go back and see is one that had a wizard on the front. Um, uh, that may have published. I can't recall if that yeah, published. You, I was actually looking online to see. Did you see that one? Yeah, the, the wizard. The, the fourth issue has the, has a big wizard on the front. Yeah. Okay, then that did come out. Okay, and that should have been number four. That was number four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and then we had uh, another issue that I, I think came out. Um, of this um, of two people on a beach with a computer, which is kind of goofy. And then we had another one. Um, where there was a, a, an attraction in Central Florida called Xanadu that was kind of the house of the future, and it had sliding doors and all this automated, uh, all this technology built in. And, and we're talking about early 80s, so think about what technology looked like back then. It's mm-hmm. nothing compared to what you see today, but but it was... Um, and so we did a, a cover uh, setting there that was kind of similar to the beach one, where somebody worked on a on, a, on either a Atari or a Commodore computer, but in a very futuristic environment. That must be the that's the one that was never published. Does that... I think that must that might be yeah that might be yeah. 
Yeah. I suppose you don't have those photos in your attic or anything hiding with your with your computer. Um, you know, I might be able to find it um, through someone who I've been talking with lately who was part of the staff at the time. Um, are you looking to maybe post something with this? I would love to. Yeah, I'd post that. I would, like the, the missing high-res cover or I, the photo shoot or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the missing high-res. Now, I, I probably would have to clear that with Tony because he may have some kind of copyright ownership to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can let me see if I can even find it. I'm not even sure we saved it because it obviously never was printed. Sure. But we would have had we would have had um, what we actually you know we had the original artwork of course, um, which was done by an artist who um, who I had worked with in the newspaper industry. But um, um, it's funny things I do remember from back then. I can I can see if um, if I can find it. I doubt I have a copy of it, um, or at least a copy that I could find. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maybe too buried in my attic. But um, let me see if someone else might have it because she was our she was our um, designer. So I would if anybody has it, she would have it. That would be awesome. Sure. Thank you so much, John. All righty. Um, have my a- pleasure. Talk to you later. Bye. A quick postscript, I talked to John after the interview and he talked to his friend and together they are sure that the photos from the fifth cover of High Res Magazine no longer exist. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.